Hello, 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 and welcome to Conservative Nation with me, your gracious host, Jermaine Baccio, on this beautiful Wednesday evening, November 7th, 2018, a day after the midterm elections, ladies and gentlemen. And on th today's episode here, I got a special guest. His name is Barry Nosebaum. He Nose is, <laughs> I hope I said that correctly, founder of the American Truth Project. He is a businessman, real estate mogul whose distinguished career extends more than 38 years. He is experienced news commentator, international affairs, who has been featured on major television networks, web-based and imprint media, an expert on foreign policy, and particularly in U.S. and Israel relations. How you doing, sir, with that beautiful title? <laughs> I, I'm flattered. I sound really good the way you describe it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, I would like to thank you for coming on the show here. I know you're a very busy man here. And um, I've been looking at your work and the things that you do. And let me tell you, uh, we need people like more people like you here in America uh, fighting the good fight. I can tell you that. Well, I appreciate your kind words. I'm happy to be with you. Uh, we got lots to talk about today, Jermaine. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Barry, let's go ahead and get into it. We got a lot to talk about today. But um, before we even get into the midterm elections and everything else, why don't you tell us uh, things about yourself here? Um, you know, inform my crowd about who you are and uh, what you do. Be happy to. I have had two dual careers for the last uh, number of decades, as you pointed out, which now people are going to be figuring out my age. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, while uh, getting educated, I started in politics a million years ago. I actually, ironically, uh, was writing opposition research to then Governor Jerry Brown uh, in the 70s in California. Uh, I never in my wildest dreams dreamed that uh, he would come back to haunt California in a later incarnation even more liberal, more progressive, more socialistic than he was in the 70s, but it's come true and as everyone in California will tell you, uh, to the detriment of the economy and the wealth of the state of California. So over the past number of decades, uh, I built successful businesses while being involved politically. Um, I've tended to be more on the conservative side as a writer and a commentator, uh, working on campaigns um, mostly on a national level and as an advisor to several presidential campaigns and senatorial campaigns on the issue of uh, American and Israel relations and American foreign policy. Uh, about five years ago, uh, I started slowing down the business side and becoming um, significantly more active in media. Uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, Jermaine, doing a lot of commentary, uh, writing. We established our organization a number of years ago called americantruthproject.org. Uh, for your viewers that want to check it out, it's very simple. Type in findberry dot com b a r r y dot com it'll take you to the website and you'll see what our issues are uh, we basically are about national security on a foreign and uh, domestic basis the threats that face us as Americans uh, primarily terrorism and uh, everyone that's informed knows where it's coming from so we talk about it uh, internationally and nationally and we talk about the relationship with the uh, canary in the coal mine as I like to call Israel they're on the front lines fighting terror every day mm -hmm. uh, so we're not fighting it as much at home but don't kid yourself uh, what they've been dealing with for decades is here now and American Truth Project does its best to educate people about it so I urge people to go to our website uh, we've got a phenomenal staff uh, putting together information on a daily basis uh, both video and in print and people that go will come away at least educated, if not energized, about wanting to get involved to help. Man, oh man, I could tell you, um, you're a busy guy. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, what got you into it? Like, what was the catalyst that got you into uh, going into this type of business here? 
because I know it's different for everybody else, but um, I just want to know what, what got you into this? You know, like you, Jermaine, I'm a first generation American. Um, your parents are from Africa. My parents uh, were from Hungary and literally my mother and my father uh, survived the Auschwitz concentration camp, which was oh, wow. the most horrific place uh, for death in world history and came to the United States after the war. Most of my relatives uh, didn't survive, as you can imagine. And so I've been a very actively patriotic person who felt the blessings of this country uh, from the time I was born. And I've been grateful for America ever since I can remember understanding where it was that I lived mm -hmm. versus where my parents came from, probably similar to your parents. Uh, people that escape to America understand that this is like no place else on earth. Yeah. And that's very energizing when you realize that the blessings of this country are not automatic and need to be defended. And that has motivated me uh, as I got to the point where I can make choices in my life. What do I want to do with the rest of the time I have? And uh, at least my decision is to protect and serve America and protect our freedoms for people like you and me and hopefully your viewers out there understand that this is not something to be passive about we all have to be in this together yes you're you're absolutely correct you know um, my story is similar to yours you know my parents came here in the 70s got naturalized as citizens um, they took being an American seriously because of the conditions that they left. You know, um, Ghana, West Africa at that time wasn't doing good economically. Um, they had a lot of stuff uh, that was hindering the people back there. My parents uh, waited 10 years for them to actually, um, you know, get immigration status for them to come to the U.S. here. And, you know, they, they really... Uh, Thank God, and they they were very humble to be in this country. You know, um, they taught me what it means to be an American. You know, have pride in your country. Um, you know, have a lot of emphasis on education, like a, a lot of foreign parents do. You know, uh, they wanted to make sure that I graduated uh, from college, had a good job, uh, make sure that I'm able to uh, have that American dream and be uh, more successful than them. You know, and um, I see a lot of people who are first generation um, Americans that you know their parents migrated here they they actually uh, really take being an American seriously and, and they understand the value of the freedoms that we have in this country so when I see people like yourself who's uh, you know who are trailblazers let me tell you because I look up to people like yourself I, I'm a young guy who, who's still trying to find my path you know so when I see that you're putting in work like this you know it energizes me and gives me uh, the spirit for me to keep going on. So I just want to commend you on that. I appreciate your good words and I think there's a lot of parallels between you and I, my friend. Like you, I, you know, I used to tell the story to my children. If I wanted to know when I was in seventh or eighth grade about the Constitution or Abraham Lincoln or George Washington, I went to my parents because they learned all of that stuff. They both knew uh, the Gettysburg Address. They knew uh, uh, the Declaration of Independence because th in those days, to become a citizen, you had to learn all of that. Yes. You had to be fluent in English. You had to have a job. And it was a lot different than it is now. And I didn't have to go to the library or ask my teacher. I just went to mom or dad. And in their heavy accents, they would tell me about Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I can tell you that. And, and um, let me tell you, they, they didn't take no stuff either. They were very stern on me. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> So um, let, let's go ahead and get rocking here. I got some questions here for you. You know, um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the Middle East. Um, Trump has been making a big impact there in the Middle East by him moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. There, um, There's a lot of people who are mad 
a lot of people were mad and upset about that. You know, um, one thing I can tell you is that there's a lot of terrorism that is going around there, and it seems to be, you know, going on and going on, and nobody can really solve that problem over there. Um, one thing I want to ask you is, uh, what are Trump's efforts against uh, Palestinian funding of terror? Because there's Palestinians are funding terrorists, um, martyrs, people. Uh, I, I believe they're giving people like 10000 to be a martyr and stuff like that. It's, it's absolutely crazy. Um, can you inform me and uh, inform our audience about uh, uh, things of that nature? Sure. Um, most people that really are informed, Jermaine, uh, and I, I, that would be me among others, uh, understand that the Palestinian Authority uh, in the West Bank which is the West Bank of the Jordan River, where they operate and rule parts of it, and Hamas, which is the terror organization that runs Gaza, um, have something that's called pay for slay. And what that means is the biggest part of their financial budget is paying people to kill Jews. Now, they've got different levels of payment. If you uh, or a martyr, which means you're dying for the cause of Islam under the Quranic um, instructions, and you die in the act of blowing yourself up, let's say, or uh, shooting somebody and are killed in the process, or running over somebody at a, at a, um, a border crossing and they kill you, then you're a, a true martyr, and that's the big money. And that money then goes to your family uh, for uh, a generation. If on the other hand you attempt to pull something like that off and are injured, they pay different amounts of money if you're shot, if you're run over, if your arm is broken, if uh, when they capture you you're injured. And then the and then that's a secondary level of payment and the, and the lower level of payment is uh, if you uh, attempt to do something and you're not hurt but you're captured and you go to jail. So it's, I know it sounds amazing, and I know yeah. it sounds incredible, and your viewers won't believe it, so I please urge them to look this up. The biggest part of the Palestinian budget, Germain, is not for teachers, not for schools, not for water, not for housing, not for transportation, not for education. It's paying the families of killers. It's not a joke, it's the biggest single part of their budget. So when Trump came to office, God bless him for this, he brought Mahmoud Abbas, the president who was elected, I think in 2005 for a four year term and refuses to leave office, so now he's a dictator till he dies, brought him into the White House and said, pay for play must stop, pay for slay must stop, or I'm gonna cut off your money. So. Mahmoud Abbas said, Mr. President, you're right, we're not going to do it anymore, went back to the West Bank, went on Palestinian TV and said, I will never stop it. No matter what President Trump says, I will never stop the martyr fund. So Trump, unlike other American presidents, is not somebody to trifle with. Yeah. He said, you gave me your word, you lied, I'm going to start cutting off your money. And that's what he's been doing. They won't stop paying people to kill Jews. So Trump said, you're not going to do it with American money. And honestly, that's been the biggest problem for the Palestinians. Their budget is shrinking because they don't have as much money to pay murderers. And you know what's really sad? They're not cutting back on it. They're cutting back other social services, Jermaine, because they don't want to cut back on the murder fund. That's that's absolutely ridiculous. I, I mean, um, how do we solve this problem? Will, will they ever stop? Can I ask you that? Well, it, you know, it's interesting. I, I was over in Israel um, some months ago. We shot about uh, 28 episodes, uh, which are available on americantruthproject.org. Um, you know, find Barry. You'll see all the episodes there. And, and I interviewed um, uh, three different ambassadors, uh, Israeli ambassadors. I interviewed uh, two different generals. I interviewed um, someone in military, the top of military intelligence. Uh, we were in Jerusalem. We were in the Gaza border where we filmed. Uh, we were at the Syrian border. Everybody says the same thing. 
And it all goes back to a quote from the former prime minister um, from the 70s in Israel, a lady named Golda Meir, who said, when the Palestinian parents, this is roughly what she said, love their children more than they want to kill ours, there will be peace. And in response, and ever since, the Palestinian leadership said, the Jews celebrate life and we celebrate death. As long as a cult of death is in government and leadership and control of the Palestinians, the answer to your question, sadly, is no, there will not be peace. Now, what's curious, and this has happened only in the last several years, the moderate Arab states, the Emirates, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and so forth, are realizing their bigger enemy is not the Jewish state, but Iran, because a nuclear-armed Shia government in Tehran wants to kill the um, Sunnis more than they want to kill Israel, because they want to dominate the Muslim world. And they feel that once they dominate the Muslim world, they'll control the rest of the world. So ironically, and I, I, I talk to many people in government in Israel are telling me that behind the scenes, there's a tremendous amount of military and economic and intelligence cooperation going on, Jermaine, between the moderate Arab states and the government in Israel. So eventually, as this becomes more public, and literally turns into exchanges of ambassadors, uh, open trade, uh, open negotiations, uh, social things like um, athletic events and tourism, Iran will become more isolated and the Arab states are saying, hey, enough with this terrorism, enough with the Palestinians wanting to kill the Jews. The Jews are now our ally against Iran. We're working together. Stop it. And yeah. they literally are pulling the rug out from under the Palestinian Authority to the point of, I think they're going to be isolated in the West Bank so much. I know this sounds horrible. They might have to make peace. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> and, and, and it's about time, let me tell you. You know, one thing I can say is that um, if Barack Obama, uh, the ex-president, um, the fallen messiah, if he was in office, I, I can tell you um, he would have never made any type of deals at all. He wouldn't at all. Um, he actually was uh, pretty, um, uh, you know, pretty staunchly against uh, Jerusalem. And um, as, as you know, um, he got mad at, um, I forgot the prime minister's name over there, um, Netanyahu, Netanyahu, uh, Netanyahu. Um, he didn't want him to even uh, try to defend his own country. You know, um, it, it's absolutely terrible that uh, we have a Democratic Party here that did not want to help Jerusalem out. Um, we have Trump who understands how um, pivotal and how uh, important it is to help uh, Jerusalem at this time and be a strong ally in there because um, we need somebody to keep the peace in that region or, or you know, or to have it at least a little bit stable, you know, if, if exactly. we can even say that. Well, you know, what's really curious is going all the way back to the 1990s, U.S. law, Jermaine, has required, required by law for the American embassy to be located in Jerusalem. That law was passed by an overwhelming majority of the House and the Senate and signed by the president. And the first president that didn't follow that law was Bill Clinton. And since then, every president until Donald Trump uh, executed a waiver every six months saying they understood the law requires the embassy to be in Jerusalem, but they were sidestepping or waiving that requirement for national security reasons, which is complete BS. So Clinton did it twice a year, and so did Bush, and so did Barack Obama. And get this, of all the countries in the world, 
from the very biggest to the teensy tiniest, there's one country in the world whose capital is not where all the embassies go. And what country is that? Israel, who yep. ironically is the country with the longest continuous capital in world history. 4,000 years Jerusalem has been the capital of the Jewish people. And it's the only country in the world where the world leaders have decided because of Arab pressure to not put their embassies there because they don't want to offend the Muslim world as if it makes a difference. And now that Trump kept his campaign promise and moved the embassy there, eventually all the other countries will too. Why? Yep. Because it's the right thing to do. God bless Donald Trump for stepping up and not waiving the law like all of his predecessors do. I was in the room, Jermaine, a number of years ago with my wife when Barack Obama made his famous speech. I think I was having dinner with, uh, it was Daryl Issa, um, who's just retiring from Congress, uh, Republican from California. And we were listening to Barack Obama make his speech, promising that as soon as he uh, was sworn in, his first move would be to move the embassy to Jerusalem. And I turned to Congressman Issa and I said, you think he's telling the truth? And Congressman Issa looked at me and he goes, nope. What do you think? And I go, nope. And turns out Barack Obama waved it every single year, just like all the presidents before him. And the first man that kept his word was Donald Trump. Absolutely. And, you know, when he said that he was going to move it, people were like, it's going to cause a, a big terror storm. Uh, you can't do this. This is a big backlash against the U.S. All we hear now is crickets. Yep. Right. Just crickets like all the way around. Um, yep. So that brings me to my next question here, since we're on uh, terror here. Um the student organization in Iran has offered a $100,000 reward to whoever bombs the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. Um, wh what do you think about that? You know, if you, if you follow the news out of Iran, and most of it doesn't get in the newspapers here uh, because it uh, doesn't fit the narrative of, of the, our Western liberal progressive media, uh, Iran threatens to destroy America and Israel uh, every week uh, when they parade their intercontinental ballistic missiles through the square in Tehran in Farsi which is their language they'll put things like death to America death to the great Satan um, this one's going to Tel Aviv and on and on and on and they've done nothing other than export terror throughout and I, I don't make light of it they've done nothing in terms of coming to bring their missiles here or their bombs here or Israel and the reason is is Israel like us would destroy Iran in a heartbeat mm -hmm. if anything God forbid like that ever happened the sad part Jermaine is we used to listen to that BS and go oh we don't want to offend these people <laughs> so what did we do under Barack Obama Barack Obama was lied to through Secretary Kerry for several years during the negotiations of the Iran nuclear deal, which is its formal name is the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or JCPOA. And they were supposed to do all these great things to become a member of the Western world and give up terrorism and stop nuclear development, stop missile development, and we would give them billions. Well, Barack Obama gave them the billions and they spent it on exporting terror all over the world and continuing to de develop missile programs. So Trump comes in and goes, okay, deal's over, I'm tearing it up, and if you screw with us, we'll destroy you. Just like he talked about with Kim Jong-un, and you know what? You speak softly and carry a big stick, or in Trump's case, you speak loudly and carry a big stick, and people <laughs> start to listen to you. And the Arab world is 100% behind Donald Trump because they don't want Iran with nuclear weapons, they don't want Iran with chemical weapons, and they sure as hell don't want Iran with intercontinental ballistic missiles that can destroy Europe, them, and the United States. 
So we'll see what happens. Uh, the oil sanctions that kicked in this week, Jermaine, oh, yeah. only a few days ago, are destroying the Iranian economy. Mm -hmm. The real, their, their currency is in free fall. And as the sanctions kick in and the United States Treasury through international banking starts putting restrictions on other companies and countries doing business with Iran, I believe very, very, very strongly that they're going to have to come back to the table. You know, one of the things that, that your viewers probably don't know that say, well, Secretary Kerry said it was a great deal and President Obama said it was a great deal and the Europeans signed it. And, and Iran is, is complying with the deal. If you've ever read the deal, it's a, it's a complete lie from what Barack Obama talked about in the Rose Garden speech a year before it was signed. We were supposed to be able to inspect all the oh, sites yeah. on where they're developing nuclear weapons. Didn't get in the deal. They weren't supposed to be developing missiles anymore. Didn't get in the deal. Nothing was supposed to be off limits didn't get in the deal. Remember Barack Obama, and you'll, you might remember this line that he used in the Rose Garden, anytime, any place inspections will be part of the deal that I will sign, and that never made it in. In other words, the inspectors call up and make an appointment. Sometimes <laughs> the appointments are accepted. Sometimes the appointments are rejected. And certain bases where the nuclear programs are get this, have never, ever, ever been inspected because they're off limits and they're not in the deal. That's why Trump tore it up. Mm -hmm. He said this is the worst deal in American history. He's right. It yeah. is. It is. It is. And I remember him saying that uh, the U.N. W were supposed to contact them and then go in for an inspection. So to me, it's like, well, basically, you're alerting folks to what is going on before uh, you go there, right? So th they can hide everything, and then you can come and hey, we have it over here. Come and take a look, right? Yeah, and then after ask, that, they take off and leave, and then you bring everything out. But can you? It, can you it never it? happened like that. It, can you imagine the DEA in America, which is which is tasked with stopping international drug importation in the United States, right? And they call up a Colombian drug lord. And they say, hey, you've got this warehouse that we have staked out. We think you've got a ton of cocaine in it. And so the drug lord goes, yeah, so? Well, we want to come inspect it tomorrow. Uh, no, how about mm, next March on the 7th <laughs> at 2 o'clock? And the DEA goes, uh, okay, see you then. Guess how much cocaine would be in that warehouse by the time the DEA got there? That's, that's the Iran nuclear deal. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's really the deal. You know, I, I don't know what's wrong uh, with, with these liberals. It, it's almost as if they're sabotaging the country with, with uh, the type of actions that they are making. One thing I can tell you is that... Um, uh, people in the Middle East, um, the third world countries that are, that are over there, they respect uh, strength and they respect people who are strong. So if, if um, we're going over there like Barack Obama was, you know, uh, apologizing, trying to appease, um, you know, doing stuff like that, it doesn't show strength at all. And those type of countries, they don't respect that. You know, uh, it, it, because to me, they're not at that level where they want to be, um, how can I say, um, civil in that type of manner. You know, there there's certain um, there's certain levels when it comes to uh, the way people behave based upon what type of uh, development they're at. And to me, they weren't at that level for them to behave in that rational uh, way. So um, p people in this country got to understand that people in the Middle East and especially uh, in, even in Africa, they respect people who are strong, who speak strong, who appear strong, who uh, who will uh, basically do what they say. So if you end up crossing a red line, guess what? There's uh, going to be retaliation. They respect that. They don't respect uh, all the soft talk and, you know, and the appeasing. 
And, and I think people don't understand that based upon um, our country's values because their values are a little bit different over there. Would you agree? Yeah. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. The, the words that I heard from everybody that we did shows with in, um, in Israel, Jermaine, and like I said, it was military, it was government, it was intelligence, people on the front lines tasked with defending Israel. Whether they were uh, liberal or conservative politically within Israel, they all had very glowing statements about Donald Trump because finally there was a leader of the American people mm. that was leading the world from the front, not from the rear, yeah. and was saying, this is the way it's gonna be, and we'll be in this together, and America's might will be with you, not the apology tour that you just referenced, not the bowing to heads of state in the Middle East, which has never happened in America's yeah. history. Um, the, the disgrace that we were put through on a national level, um, had profound effects in areas poli geopolitically, Jermaine, where, like you said, they respect strength, they respect power, mm -hmm. and most importantly, you keep your word and they can trust you. You know, the infamous line in the sand that Barack Obama <laughs> drew in Syria, you know, I, I did an interview which um, I've written up but I haven't published yet with the Syrian, uh, the American ambassador to Syria. And he told me face to face, and there was a witness in the room, so I, I, I have someone that can verify what I'm about to tell you. When I interviewed him, I said, why did you leave office? And he said, it's very simple. The American people, through their president, told Assad, the dictator in Syria, not to use poison gas on his own people. And if he crossed that and committed genocide, with weapons of mass destruction, there would be an immediate, very brutal response from the American military. And when we did nothing, we told Assad, basically, go kill whoever you wanted. Mm -hmm. And he said, and I couldn't be part of that anymore. As a Democrat, I immediately tendered my resignation to the president, and that was the end of my government service for the uh, Obama administration. So. The rest of the world saw it too, Jermaine. Yeah. We did nothing. Words mean nothing in the Middle East if you're a paper tiger. And now we have a president that sent missiles into Syria, and all of a sudden Syria's like, whoa, new sheriff in town. <laughs> if he says no poison gas, maybe we should listen. I mean, these are horrible, despicable crimes, Jermaine. Mm -hmm. I mean, mass slaughter of innocent people. And these are, in the most cases, Muslims killing Muslims. It, it doesn't matter because it's all about power. But now there's somebody, at least in, thank goodness, at the White House today that, that says what he means and means what he says. And people are going to be uh, upset that they don't like the way he says it and they think he ought to be off Twitter and they don't think he's polished. I, I'm one of those people that says, you know what? I care about the policy. Yeah. I didn't yeah. like the guy because of his home life or his um, his his communication at three o'clock in the morning, I, I I wanted him to be president because he was going to create a foreign policy change that America desperately needed mm -hmm. internationally, mm -hmm. and it's been profound, and the world is taking notice, and I think the world will follow. Yeah, yeah, and you can see it all across uh, the world right now. Even look at North Korea, right? They were talking about uh, the summit not happening with uh, King Jong-un. And uh, guess what? It happened. You know, um, so it, you have to show strength on, on that side of the world to get respect. And you have to follow through with what you say. And that's something that I know that uh, people over there respect just like... Uh, in the African countries. If, if you speak, you better uh, act upon what you say. If you don't, people will take note on that and uh, basically write you off. And, and uh, they wrote off America, but now uh, Donald Trump is in office. And let me tell you, everybody is holding on to their seatbelts because uh, <laughs> I, I'm telling you, he is doing 
a very good job. And I want people to make sure that they go ahead and follow you. Why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us where we can find all your material at, where people can go and uh, donate and, um, and see uh, your work in action. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, americantruthproject.org is very easy to find, but we made it even easier which with the moniker findberry, B-A-R-R-Y.com. Findberry.com takes you right to it. You'll see the stuff that we produce. You'll see my stuff there. Um, uh, there are shows every week where we are educating you and you want to make a donation. We appreciate it. Uh, American Truth Project is a 501c3 IRS recognized tax deductible organization so everybody gets a tax deduction by helping us to educate Americans about the threats that we're facing foreign and domestic. So Barry thank you thank you thank you for coming on Conservative Nation it was such a treat to have you. Um, you you're an instrumental guy here in the uh, you know the fight for good let me tell you and hopefully we can uh, pull America out of the stupor that they are in and so that we can uh, rise again to be uh, number one like we always are so thank you <laughs>